Hi and welcome back to Free Science Lessons. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how scientists determine that DNA replication is semi-conservative. Now I should warn you that this can seem a pretty tricky topic, but stick with it and you'll get it. This topic is directly stated in the AQA spec, but if you're studying a different spec, then I would still recommend that you watch this. You might see this in a question where you're given information and have to apply your knowledge. In the last video, we looked at how DNA is replicated. We saw that scientists call this mechanism semi-conservative replication. In semi-conservative replication, the DNA double helix separates into two polynucleotide strands. Each strand is then replicated into a complementary new strand. So at the end, one molecule of DNA has been copied into two molecules of DNA. Now the key idea you need to get about semi-conservative replication is that each of the two copies contains one strand from the original DNA molecule plus one new strand. I'm shown the original strand in white and the new strand in red. Now, when the structure of DNA was first discovered in the 1950s, scientists did not know how DNA replicated. Semi-conservative replication was one possibility, but another possibility was conservative replication, which I'm showing you here. In conservative replication, a DNA double helix is formed containing two new strands. This DNA molecule contains none of the original DNA. So scientists had to design an experiment to show whether DNA replicates by conservative or semi-conservative replication. And I'm going to take you through that experiment in the next section. Okay, now to understand this experiment, you need to get one idea. All of the bases in DNA contain the element nitrogen. And nitrogen atoms exist in two main forms or isotopes. These are nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15. Nitrogen-14 is the most common isotope, with over 99% of nitrogen atoms being nitrogen-14. Now the key fact is that atoms of nitrogen-15 are slightly heavier than atoms of nitrogen-14. OK, the scientists took a sample of bacteria. Now under normal conditions, almost all of the nitrogen atoms in the DNA of these bacteria will be nitrogen-14, in other words the lighter isotope. The scientists now took some of these bacteria and extracted the DNA. They then placed the DNA in a solution and spun this at very high speeds in a centrifuge. The DNA moved down the solution and formed a band which the scientists could detect. Now a key idea you need to understand is that the position of the DNA band depends on how heavy the DNA is. Because the nitrogen atoms in this DNA were almost all nitrogen-14, in other words light nitrogen, this formed a band near the top of the tube. I'm going to represent DNA containing light nitrogen as faint lines. Next, the scientists cultured the bacteria in a growth medium which contained only nitrogen-15. After the bacteria had reproduced many, many times, almost all of the nitrogen atoms in their DNA was nitrogen-15, in other words, heavy nitrogen. When this DNA was extracted and centrifuged, it formed a band near the bottom of the tube. I'm going to represent DNA containing heavy nitrogen as thick lines. So to summarise so far, when bacteria were grown on nitrogen-14, because their DNA was lighter, it formed a band near the top of the tube. But when bacteria were grown on nitrogen-15, because their DNA was heavier, it formed a band near the bottom of the tube. OK, now at this stage, the scientists took a sample of the bacteria, which had been growing on nitrogen-15, in other words, heavy nitrogen. The scientists transferred these bacteria to nitrogen-14 and allowed them to replicate their DNA only once. The scientists then extracted the DNA and spun it in a centrifuge. What they found was that this DNA produced a band in between the two bands produced before. This told the scientists that this DNA contained one strand with nitrogen-14 and one strand with nitrogen-15. Now this was really important because this means that the DNA must have replicated semi-conservatively. Remember that in semi-conservative replication, the DNA produced contains one strand from the original DNA plus one completely new strand. So in this case, the replicated DNA had one strand containing nitrogen-15 and one strand containing nitrogen-14. Now at this point, the scientists allowed the bacteria to replicate one more time on nitrogen-14. When the DNA was extracted and spun, it produced a band pattern like I'm showing you here. We've still got the intermediate band, 
but we now have another band near the top of the tube. Now we can explain this if we go back to our previous diagram. After the second round of replication, we've got four DNA molecules. Two contain a strand with nitrogen 14 and a strand with nitrogen 15, and we can see these here. These represent this band. The other two DNA molecules both contain two strands with only nitrogen 14, and we can see these here. These represent this band. OK, now in the exam you could be asked to suggest what the results would show if DNA replicates conservatively rather than semi-conservatively. Remember that in conservative replication, we end up with one molecule of DNA containing two original strands and one molecule of DNA containing two new strands. Going back to our experiment, after one round of replication, we would have one DNA molecule containing only nitrogen 15 and one DNA molecule containing only nitrogen 14. After two rounds of replication, we would still have one DNA molecule containing only nitrogen 15 but we'd now have three DNA molecules containing only nitrogen 14. Notice that we'd have no DNA molecules containing both nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15. So with conservative replication, we would get the banding pattern shown here. OK, so hopefully now you can describe how scientists determine that DNA replication is semi-conservative. Mm -hmm.